Life is Strange Double Exposure is the long-awaited sequel to the original Life is Strange game. Once again, this release has you following Max Caulfield on a whole new adventure this time around. Personally, I'm borderline obsessed with the original if I'm being real, so my hype for this uh, installment was pretty up there. After many, many years of waiting for the sequel, I'm happy to report that this one is worth existing and your time. Stick around for the rest of the video as I break down the game with you and tell you why exactly Life is Strange Double Exposure is worth a playthrough. Thank you everyone watching this. If you do enjoy today's video, make sure you subscribe and hit that like button. It helps me out a ton. Uh, I appreciate that, but let's get back to the video. Warning, warning, spoilers are ahead. This is a full spoiler review. Just getting that out of the way, so there's no excuses if you didn't hear me say that. Okay, for starters, I must say I'm very happy I managed to stay away from any trailers and stuff before the game dropped. If you're able to avoid them, I think it's best and it helps you enjoy your first playthrough of this game so much more when you don't know what's going on for a decent bit of it. The early stages of Chapter 1 have you exploring areas and getting to know a couple key characters. They tease you a couple times with Max's powers and whether she's going to use them or not, and she does not. I thought it was a nice touch to keep you on your toes. But my dumbass didn't know she had new powers this time around because I avoided all the trailers. So, uh, surprise, surprise. You hang out with your new friend, Sophie, and get introduced to Max's new love interest, at Amanda, Amanda, as well, here in the early going. The whole Amanda thing is something I didn't really feel like helps this game's case for being a good one. It ends up being a pretty unfinished story by the end of it, and I wasn't really happy about it, to say the least, for a decent bit of it. Afterwards, Max and her couple of close friends, Sophie and Moses, and yes, I said Moses. I'm sorry, what was that? Chill on a rooftop for a little bit while Sophie reveal or Sophie, I'm gonna say Sophie a couple times because it I've never heard the name Sophie in my life, if I'm being honest. But Sophie reveals that she has a happy secret, but she really doesn't want to tell anyone yet, so she doesn't. I believe in the scenario you can get her to reveal the secret. But I failed miserably, so that did not happen for me. But honestly, that's okay because that was another mystery added to the actual story that we get along with here. Sophie gets a phone call and disappears into the winter night, and Max gets uneasy whenever she sees her talking on the phone up there in the darkness in the woods all alone at night. And Max, being the concerned friend that she is, ends up finding her closest friend dead at the Overlook in the snow in a bloody pool of her own blood. And it's, it's kind of shocking. And all of a sudden, we do have a murder mystery game on our hands, and this is where I must honestly say I love a good murder mystery. It's right up my alley, and the first three chapters or so of this game is a 10 out of 10 for me for that reason, and I'm being honest with you. I wish the game stayed a 10 out of 10, which is why you should probably stick around for the rest of this video, because the game is not a 10 out of 10 as a whole after chapter 3 especially, unfortunately. After Sophie's death, you get introduced to her uh, phone for the first time, which is a cool gameplay touch. I wish they gave you more options th for the responses if I criticize it a little bit. Uh, like, sometimes you just get forced into one response, and I think you should at least have a couple choices. Yes, it sucks, by the way, that Chloe isn't directly in the game in person, but I'm pretty sure the whole reason for that is the potential of Chloe not being alive anymore from the first game. And this is a topic that I have to touch on because I've seen other people give their opinions on this game and they bash this game because they don't seem to understand why Chloe's not there in the presence. It's because that you literally can't do that because what if somebody chose to have her get killed in the other game and you actually get a chance to literally choose that again in this game by telling, I forget who it is, one of the friends that you have, it might be Amanda, if Chloe's dead or not. So you can't really put her there in person in physical form if she's dead, you know, like you can't write half the game around her. Does that make sense? Also visually, the this installment of Life is Strange is by far the best looking one. The world and the characters are pretty great. Only a slight nitpick from me I have is sometimes the characters display some goofy looking expressions on their face, despite the expressions looking realistic 90% of the time. Plus, pretending to be in a revenge horse is way cooler than pretending to be in a misery cult. There was a couple times that I chuckled a little bit because they were a little ridiculous looking. <laughs> as we head back to the story though, I feel like this is a good time to talk about characters you meet along the way as well. Uh, first is Vin. Uh, he comes off as a smug punk ass bitch if I'm being real with you. And I want to reach across the table and slap him across the face most of the time I talk to him. 
or if you're dying for stimulation, I've got a package waiting for me down the hall. You're welcome to get it for me. He's also the leader of this secret society, Abraxas, which is used more to raise suspicions about him than actually anything useful along the journey. Uh, then you have Yasmin, that's Sophie's mom, the girl that got killed. Uh, she's kind of your typical high authority asshole, in my opinion. She plays that part well. Uh, and Vin also works as uh, her uh, secretary slash assistant on the side. He works the desk outside of her office, just so you know, as we go along. Uh, next is Gwen, a transsexual professor at the school. And don't get me started on that one. We're going to move on. Uh, plus a few more, actually, that we could talk about along the way. We don't have to really jump into every single person here. I, uh, Moses is like your nerdy friend and stuff like that. And uh, that kind of brings me to an issue I felt as far as the characters and the game as a whole goes. There's a lot of copy and paste elements from the original. And I'm cool with that to a point, but there's a little bit much here. Like character wise, for instance, Vin reminds you of like a Nathan Prescott for a decent bit of it. Uh, your nerd friend Moses, similar to Warren, and then even the whole story itself revolving around Sophie, aka Chloe in this instance, dies. And Max gets her powers from that tragedy and she tries to fix it just like the first game. There's just a lot of similarities and I wish they would have switched it up a little bit. And one last small negative, after Sophie's death, I didn't really like the way they wrote Max for this brief period of time. I know she's been through some tough shit in the past before, but like, she literally just discovers her close friend dead in the snow in a pool of her own blood, but she's very, very calm in not like a trauma way. She just doesn't seem to care or give a crap about it at all for like the first little bit following that. And her crush Amanda comes over and Max feels more focused on impressing Amanda than the fact that her friend just died. Shit. Oh. My place is a mess. Shit, shit, shit. I'm a mess. I will say that does pass in time, so overall Max is portrayed pretty well as a whole. I just thought for this little bit I had to at least bring it up because it was kind of, it, it threw me for a loop immediately. Circling back to the story, though, we get introduced to Max's new powers for the very first time, and I enjoy them, to say the least. Uh, straight out of the MCU, Max figures out that there's a parallel timeline that she can travel between, and in this other timeline, Sophie is actually still alive. So as far as the mystery goes, I was very intrigued and couldn't put the game down for a little bit here. The first couple chapters were pretty addicting. From this point, you mostly jump between timelines, gathering evidence to piece together what happened to Sophie during her death between both timelines. There's different things that happen. Also, side note, because we're around that time in the game, do not and do not, I repeat, do not, I can't repeat it enough. Waste extra money on the deluxe versions of this game. Uh, here you get like a few more clothing options and stuff like that if you want to actually spend the money for that. And this cat thing, this is why I'm bringing it up now because it kind of becomes present here. I don't know really what this cat thing is, but I think it's like 30, 20, something like that extra dollars. And do not support that shit in games. I know they're going to keep doing it anyways, but the more you support it, the more they're going to do it. It's not worth your dough. But after basically an entire episode of interviewing suspects here in episode or chapter two, whatever, they used to be episodes, they're chapters now. Uh, but yeah, interviewing suspects, gathering evidence while also having a nosy cop on your ass the whole time that knows something is off about Max. So that keeps you on your toes for a little bit. You reach the end of chapter two, revealing a picture of Max shooting Sophie. And I was like, wait, what? And if you didn't get your attention grabbed up to this point by that, I feel like you're kind of just hating on the game because it was done pretty well. After the shocking reveal, Max is left a little shaken by it and what she's seen and you're not exactly sure what Max could do to like pull something off like this. This does lead Max to bring her time traveling powers back out of retirement for a brief moment. She travels through the pictures and tries to see what exactly happens and this leads to more mystery honestly than it does solutions for now. I mean, really, if I'm being honest, her time traveling uh, powers are used as like a plot device in this. And I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I know she's trying to keep them down because it literally killed Arcadia Bay in the first game. But I, I don't know, like she either has them, has them or she doesn't. During this upcoming period of chapter three, Moses learns about your power along with that cop as well that's on your ass. I mean, he doesn't directly learn about it, the cop, but he's definitely on you. So what happens to the cop, though, for discovering you? Well, don't worry about it. The game takes care of him and killing him off in the most unexplainable plot armor way possible. Watch out! 
The cop dying was really my only main main issue for the first three chapters, so I mean, if there's only one main negative, I'm gonna let it slide. It is at this point of the game that you pretty much know that Sophie's secret from earlier on was a big book deal that she had, but somebody had it canceled right from underneath of her. So you're searching for her being killed and who her killer is, and at the same time you're trying to figure out who stabbed Sophie in the, or Sophie in the back to cancel her big accomplishment. Before we finish chapter 3, I must say Max is quite a hornball as well in this installment. Illicit day drinking with your coworkers is sexy. Be sexy, Max. Far be it for me to pass up an opportunity to accrue more sexy points. Minus five sexy points to me then. <laughs> Uh, plenty of love interest drama to be had if you're into that kind of thing. It, it does draw my interest a little bit, but Max was going a little far. You get Vin as an option at some point too, and I turned him down with the easiest decision I think I've ever made in any game ever. That dude is a dick, and I wanted no part of that dick. His snobby punk ass can go cry about it later in the corner by himself. I don't give a crap. He's not a good person. I don't even know why he's a love interest in this game. And you also have Amanda, which I had Max passionately kiss in the middle of the bar right around. Well, no, I guess that's a different timeline. But I mean, right after rejecting Vin, I did this. Yeah, Max just kind of does it while she's working and they're they're both just all for it. Max has this horny dog in her and they even start doing the dirty deed in the middle of the bar. Wait, what do you say? I'm kidding. Hold up. That's fucked up, man. Maybe that didn't happen, but would have made a wild moment. Only the kissing happens. Damn it. It's not like the game holds back the wild sexual tension, so I, would, I wouldn't put it past it. There's some comments in here that kind of get extreme. You just wait till I'm feeling better. I could eat you under the table. <laughs> Wowzers. Shit. That came out wrong. Anyway, enough about horny characters. The end of chapter three leads you to discovering somebody breaking into Max's house and going through all of her stuff. You find out it's the other Max, and I was like, hell yeah, this is gonna get real interesting. You chase other Max through the wintry night and finally capture her, and suddenly she morphs into Sophie to end chapter three, and you're left saying, what? They, they ended the first, or, er, well, not the first two, but chapter two and three very, very well, just like an old school Life is Strange game would do. I do, I mean, I don't know, I do like the old episodic releases every once in a while, like they didn't give you the whole game to start, but I mean, also, I don't know, it's tough for me to say, I feel like that's debatable whether you want to get the whole game or you want to wait chapter by chapter. And just so you're following, Sophie from the world where she's still alive ends up being a shapeshifter, which is why she went from Max to herself. It's not the dead Sophie, it's the one in the Alive timeline, which is a great twist at the end, but it leads to average results. I'm also in the camp of not liking more than the main characters to have powers, so like in these Life is Strange games, it makes them feel less special and unique whenever like everyone has powers. Obviously not everybody, but you know what I mean. If they start passing out powers to this person and this person, which they do in this game, but let's get into chapter four a little bit more. My first negative, and really it's just comes down to it being too short in length. I'm not sure why chapter four and five are half the length of one, two, and three, but for whatever reason, I finished four and five in the length of time that it took me to finish one of the first three chapters, and that disappointed me. During four, you and Sophie try to expose Lucas, a writer from the school, and I believe he's also a professor. I don't know exactly on that one. I could be wrong. But uh, yeah, he stole Sophie's dead friend's writing to rise himself to fame. I'm not deep diving into this, so sorry if that's a little confusing. I just thought this like side story was a little bit underwhelming, but it goes into uh, figuring out the whole book thing, so I gotta bring it up because Sophie is really involved in this and her motivation comes from it. I just thought this side story was kind of pointless for a little bit. Uh, fast forwarding a little bit, though, and uh, Living World Sophie, the shapeshifter, is found again by Max at the Winery Overlook, but this time she's pointing a gun at her own mother. After uh, she talked to uh, Lucas on the side, the writer guy, I guess the writer guy threw Yasmin under the bus, and uh, Sophie discovers the truth that her mother is actually the one who canceled her book deal, so Sophie's going through it right now. And then her uh, shape-shifting powers just start going absolutely haywire, and as she loses control, uh, she shoots her mother in the shoulder, I want to say, or the arm, I can't remember exactly. She shoots her in the upper body, not enough to kill her, but Max tries to calm her down, and uh, she contains her, I guess, by traveling through time with her. I think? Don't quote me on that 100%. I really tried to do a little bit of research too, but I couldn't exactly figure it out. 
Yeah, I just, I don't know. At this point, I just legit didn't know what was happening half of the time. And it really kind of took me out of the ending of these last couple chapters. And uh, by the way, that is also the end of chapter four already. Cool. Makes a lot of sense. So I went into the last chapter praying that they'd finish the awesome murder mystery with a bang that I was just so intrigued by and so into for so long. And that was not the case at all. During this time travel, you come across basically everyone you've met along the way. And they're all being basically possessed by uh, Safi during this little time travel sequence. So Max pulls out her camera, takes a couple pictures of them using her little double exposure. Because, you know, title of the game, wink, wink. And uh, doing that, apparently that ejects Safi from their bodies because, you know, logic. After doing this, you uh, return to the normal world and Safi says she is leaving. And you either disagree or agree to stand by her side. And uh, yeah, when you return, and that's that that's literally it. That's the game. I'm sorry to somewhat rush the ending here, but the chapters were so short that you barely get anything to like talk about here in the last couple chapters. Sophie still remains dead in the one timeline, and I guess Max is still the one that killed her from what I gathered. I could be wrong on that one as well. I tried to figure that out, and I couldn't get an exact answer from anything I looked up. But yeah, so Max is a murderer, so that's cool. And then Sophie, who I feel like is uh you're you're like supposed to sympathize for her but she is terribly selfish and i just don't think she's a good person in general so she gets to go away as a free living loving person and i just don't think she should get away with a lot of the stuff she does because she's a terrible human being and i i just this game ended up turning into a game of almost two halves like completely different scales and i think this leads to my final score for life is strange double exposure being a uh, seven out of ten I could see an argument for six, but I really thought the first three chapters were enough for me to bump that up because they were great and they are the longest part of the game. I still think it's worth your time. The first three chapters, intriguing enough, tons of interest. They drop the ball pretty hard after that. And the last couple short chapters just aren't enough for me. They, it went from a 10 out of 10 down to a seven just for those last couple chapters and a couple little nitpick things. I do think it's worth existing after all this time away from Max, which is a cool thing. But they tease in the post credit scene that Max is coming back for more down the line. And that is the part that I'm not excited about. Uh, Diamond, I, th I believe her character is. We really didn't get to talk to her about her or about her too much. She's a very, very side character, in my opinion. Very unimportant. But they try to make her important at the end here as Sophie returns back. Uh, they interact with each other and she Sophie notices that Diamond has powers. And here we go with everyone turning into X-Men. And I'm just not for it. So coming down the line here, I don't think I'm going to be as excited for the next Life is Strange with Max involved. But yeah, I'm very curious to hear all of your opinions in the comments if you have played it. This is yet another controversial game release this year, so please let me know what you think. And also, if you're planning on picking it up to try it out if you haven't played it. I don't think uh, Life is Strange games, I will say, are as good as like a full price so if I were you, I mean, they're under 10 hours and they, that's pretty much all you get out of it. Yeah. A couple of different things happen if you want to play through it a couple of times, but there's nothing outside of the main, like under 10 hours story. So put this on your black Friday list or your holiday discount shopping list. And I think you'll be a little bit more happy with it. If you enjoyed today's video though, don't forget to give it a like and maybe subscribing to the channel for more videos in the future. That is going to be it from me today. See ya. Next time. Remember the class goes on the table.